Since I can remember, when we were three or four, we were already building model airplanes. And you just gave it a little push and out it'd go, yeah. and then it, you'd watch it and then say, oh damn, there goes my 25 cent kit. <laughs> I built, as you see, all these model airplanes that are here. I built model airplanes as a young boy. So I never did believe that when I was doing that, yeah, I was nine years old maybe, I was ten, I never realized that I would wind up flying those same things that, that I was making. In 1929, America's fascination with flight had reached fever pitch. Chicago was becoming a central hub for aviation in the Midwest. The open farmlands of North Suburban Glenview were chosen as the perfect site to build an alternative to the region's then main airport, smog-choked, busy Midway Field. Glenview's Curtis Reynolds Airfield was designed and constructed with every modern amenity of its time, a literal fly-in country club. The stock market had other plans, however, and the crash of 29 was followed by a deep economic depression that kept the elite flying club from ever getting off the ground. During the lean years that ensued, national and international air races were held in Glenview, keeping the airfield financially afloat and bringing visits from aviation pioneers and luminaries such as Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh. But as war loomed on foreign shores, the escapism of the flight shows gave way to the country's need for ready air defenses. And the Navy arrived in Glenview, eventually purchasing all of Curtis Reynolds Airfield. During World War II, Naval Air Station Glenview would play a pivotal role to our victory in the Pacific. Due to the safety of its non-coastal location, Naval Air Station Glenview became the command center for a unique freshwater primary carrier pilot training program during World War II. Using two coal-burning paddle wheel makeshift carriers stationed in Lake Michigan, the USS Wolverine and the USS Sable, pilots took off from Glenview, used the Baha'i Temple in Wilmette as a visual landmark, and practiced landings and takeoffs on the ships. Over 17,000 Navy pilots were qualified during this time, including former President George H.W. Bush, who at 19 was the second youngest to qualify at Glenview. Other men who served at Glenview would go on to make extraordinary contributions to our country, including former President Gerald Ford, astronaut Neil Armstrong, and Edward Butch O'Hare. History was made in Glenview when the first African-American Navy pilot, Jesse Leroy Brown, received the first phase of his flight training here in 1946. Through most of the 20th century, Naval Air Station Glenview continued to be crucial to the defense of this country, serving as Cold War U.S. headquarters for both Naval and Marine Reserve Aviation Training Commands. From World War II to the Gulf War, the Naval Air Station Glenview proudly served our country, providing critical training ground for all five branches of the military. Wings haven't flown over Glenview now since the Navy closed its runways here for the last time in February 1995. Yet the contributions made here will never be forgotten. Let the stories you are about to hear capture the spirit of everyday heroes who served at Glenview and preserve their own rightful place in Glenview's proud military history. Well, first thing I told them when I became 16, I was going to join the Navy. But they wouldn't let me join the Navy at 16, so I got my mother's permission to join the Navy. And uh, she says, if that's what you want to do, that's what you're going to do. I was sort of the youngest in the group, and, and so they just, uh, they all left. And I said, ah. so I joined. I joined the Navy. Well, the war started, and I was in college. I was not quite through two years, I was just about one year. And the, 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 uh, the advertising came out, broadcast about 
that Navy was looking for Navy pilots. Yeah. I took the test and it was quite easy. It was not that you, hard. You were nice so I was accepted in, for, for, uh, for flight training. And a month after I was 17, I joined the Navy and really grew up in the Navy. I enlisted on what they call the kiddie cruise. If you went in before your 18th birthday, you were discharged a day before you were 21. So I served three years and 11 months. And in those days, the voting age was 21. So I had been in the Navy almost four years and still wasn't eligible to vote. Young servicemen with dreams of flying were required to complete several weeks of ground school before ever seeing the inside of a cockpit. Winning their wings would take about a year. Qualifying to be a carrier pilot required eight successful takeoffs and landings upon an aircraft carrier in the sea. This captain was our, was our flight leader and he was only going to check us out on the carrier. He took four of us out. And he said, and he told us on the radio, he said, now I want you guys to look good because there's a lot of Navy guys here and that Navy ship is going to watch you guys like a hawk. Okay. Anyway, we went out to the carrier. I didn't know where it was. It was in the Atlantic somewhere. And we flew out there and I thought, you know, it must, why wouldn't they be up closer? Well, they just wanted us to, to learn how to get there. You know? Navigate out Navigate to the Navigate out there, yeah. Sure. So, so the pilot, the, the skipper, the guy that was leading us, he's, he's number one, and I'm number two. And, and then the, the second section leader is three and four. Right. So the two, two go around, and we come off first. So he broke, and as he's turning to go into the carrier, I had to fly around one more time. Otherwise, I'd be too close to him. Right. So he's telling me on the, he's telling me on the phone now, now, get in there tight, you know, and stay and watch me you know, and see the way I'm coming aboard. And, you know, you've got to come in and then straighten out. I'm making my turn and I'm coming around and I see a big splash in the water. He spun in. Really? The, the pilot, this, this uh, experienced pilot from Guadalcanal and everywhere else, he's telling me how to fly on the carrier. He got so tight, he wanted to put on such a good show with the carrier people, he goes in the drink. Oh my gosh. So, well, he didn't get killed. He oh, just okay. splashed the Corsair is like a sled. Well, he wouldn't come out of the ready room to see us. He was so embarrassed. <laughs> so I never saw him before, never saw him then and ever again. I liked the jumping out of airplanes. Well, it's a lot of fun when you're 18 years old. It's very exhilarating, and it, it, gives, it gives you a good uh, sense of accomplishment, knowing you've done something that... Of course, now, uh, sport parachuting is very popular. In those days, most people didn't, uh, didn't do that. So it was satisfying knowing you're doing something that most people don't have the opportunity to do other than military. Do you think uh, war is like Hollywood? Everybody comes home, you know? Mm -hmm. Far from it. The only one I was at was in uh, Iwashima. And uh, we took supplies from the uh, supply ships into the beaches so that the guys could get their tanks and things like that on the, on the beaches and everything like that. And we were lucky enough that we were close enough to pick up the guys that had gone into the water. And uh, the gentlemen that were in the tanks were not too lucky. Some of them perished, and some of them got closed the hatches. And then when the water filled up, they went out and swam to the surface. I'm sure. We all had a, a we have our book that is all authenticated every month. I had to sign it, and then the operations officer signs it. Every time you had 20 missions over, over the front lines, you got an air medal. Oh. It's called a combat air medal, so I had 126 missions. If you converted uh, 126 missions into two hours each, wow. that's the number of hours you're in combat. 
and you're bound to get shot at, and, and, and nobody likes you. I got the DFC. The uh, Distinguished Flying that, Cross. That's the one on top. That's the one on top of your ribbons. Yeah, that's a Distinguished Flying Cross. And we were doing our job. Sure. And, and to get a DFC uh, is doing your job, really, and, but doing it better than normal. Well, it was really an interesting, uh, there was an old phrase that we used to use that was hours and hours of boredom broken only by moments of sheer terror. Uh, <laughs> the typical mission would be you would have a pre-flight um, uh, briefing on the mission itself that would take anywhere from an hour to two hours. You had to pre-flight the aircraft, you had to fuel the aircraft, you have to make sure that it's, uh, it's mission capable, mission ready. Uh, and then your missions would range anywhere from an eight-hour mission to, in some cases, a 12-hour mission. So uh, it was a long, those were long flights uh, and uh, uh, required a lot of uh, sort of physical endurance uh, because the, uh, uh, you know, the environment was not necessarily what one would call user-friendly. <laughs> uh, the mission was, uh, was out of Kibi Point in the Philippines. We were on a standard search mission. We were tracking a Russian Akula submarine, which is their most modern uh, submarine. It's, a, it's an pardon me, a, a nuclear uh, a boat. And uh, so we would fly along at, uh, at uh, around 150 to 200 feet off the water, uh, uh, tracking this, uh, this uh, uh, submarine. And we just happened to see on the horizon a little dot, a little tiny dot and uh, flew over to it and we found a boat dead in the water. In other words, it had no power. And on the top of this boat, it had SOS painted on it and it said VN refugees. Then we went out in the sea lanes, we were able to find uh, a, a container ship called the Anders Marsk, Dutch um, uh, ship. And then we dropped flares in the water to guide that ship out of the sea lane uh, to pick up those uh, refugees. I was, on a, I was on a cap, a combat air patrol. I was circling. They called me and said they have a mission for me and if, would, I, would I take it? They had this big cruiser out in the ocean. I never saw it. It was so far out that they had a mission that they found an ammunition depot that the, that the pilots couldn't find and their, their intelligence found it, and it was underground. I said I would, you know, I would watch them, spot them for them. So they did, they did a terrific amount of barrage. They told me to stay below 6,000 feet. Now I, I wanted to stay as high as I could because I was way up north. Yeah, and they're shooting at you from north, the ground. And black puffs were coming all over the place. You know? Flak was, uh, was in the air. Black and white, you can tell the difference. Really? Different guns, yeah. After I saw what they did, they wanted me to go down and, and count the MIAs. So go even lower? KIAs. Sure. So I, <laughs> I said, okay, but I can't see anything down there. I said, you guys cleaned it out. Right. It's, it's 100%. I gave them 100% uh, coverage wow. for the target. Huh. So they said, well, go down there and see what you can see. So I went down there and I, I didn't see anything, so I said, I'm assuming that you demolished the whole place. Right, right. And it looked good. It was all So you were, the, you were the only pilot, the only airplane. I was the only one there. That was yeah. spotting for that. That's right. During World War II, Naval Air Station Glenview was fully enveloped in training carrier pilots who were crucial to our country's defense in the Pacific. Thereafter, the base became the U.S. headquarters for Naval and Marine Reserve Aviation Training Commands a vital station tasked with protecting both U.S. coasts. The base was a flurry of activity with many reservists living and raising their families right here in Glenview. It's a good, busy base in a good location and a lot of things to see around the Glenview area. Um, several hundred of us uh, would commute uh, uh, to Naval Air Station Glenview. We lived in the barracks. Uh, and uh, it was a bit rustic, <laughs> I guess you could say, because the barracks were, were built in World War II, so they were a little, little uh, rough shot. We would get on the plane and fly to places like Brunswick, Maine, or to um, uh, Moffett Field in, in San Francisco, and then perform a mission on Saturday and Sunday um, in support of the active duty uh, squadrons that were serving that area. 
and then come back on Sunday and go home. When people would say, well, why, why do you like that? Why do you stay doing that? And I would say, well, you know, some people go out and, and they go deer hunting. Some people go out and they, they love to fish. Some guys like to hang around with their brethren, right, and play cards, smoke cigars, right, drink beer, watch TV, go to, right. Um, my uh, friends and I go out and hunt submarines. Wound up coming over here for 22 more years every reservist, you know, the weekend warriors, where you did 44 days a year uh, on the weekends, one weekend a month. Then you had two weeks of active duty. And I actually did more traveling in the two weeks uh, than I did the whole four years I was in the uh, regular Navy, because we did as many as eight countries in, uh, in the two weeks while we were overseas hauling cargo and passengers. We did everything from uh, red label gears, munitions, to uh, bands and choirs, and even uh, bringing back some of the uh, AWOL fellas. And uh, it was a pretty interesting time, and the camaraderie, we still get together over here at the uh, Little Villa for a reunion every year. Well, my orders say, my orders read, report to the commanding general at Glenview, Air, at Glenview Naval Air Station for further duty. They didn't say what, they just said for further duty. And I checked in here and the general wanted to see me. And he said, uh, were, you, uh, were you ever a commanding officer? And I said, no sir, I was an executive officer of VMO 6. He says, well you are now headquarters squadron CO. Wow. Right here, Glenview. So you took over as CO? I took over as CO. And I was here for uh, the balance of my tour before I got out. My duties here at Glenview were the same as had been in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, maintaining the parachutes, uh, teaching and instructing pilots and air crewmen if they had to leave the aircraft while it was up in the air. It was a, as they would say, a blind date. And a, a guy that was stationed here, I knew his wife, and uh, she said, would you like a date sometime? And we have a young lady and everything like that. And I said, uh, yeah, why not? So when I met her the first time, I didn't, she was kind of leery of me and I was kind of leery of her, as they would say, when you've got a blind date, you know, and everything like that. And they says, how would you like, like to do it again? You know, blind date and all that with her. And I says, okay. And all of a sudden I became smitten with her, as they would say, or something like that. We were going for about a year or so, and then finally I decided to get married. So we were in the chapel here at the base. And you celebrated an anniversary in the chapel, didn't you? Uh, the uh, anniversary was uh, when the chapel was being moved from the uh, Patriot Drive to the uh, a uh, place where it's at now, I went and uh, we went back in there again and took our vows again. When I came back, it was really a very sad time because it's like I was the only one that came back. All my friends were gone. The mothers would come over. they call me Richard and Jack. And I felt kind of out of place. Why did you come home and they didn't? And, and the sad thing is, those that passed on, it was over. But for the families, not until they passed away. It was with them the rest of their life. And that really is sad. I remember, you know, they always wanted me to give talks about things, and I said, no. I, I said, one thing is, remember this. The price of freedom is a great one. And <clears throat> you have to be stronger than those trying to take it away. And you have to be constantly vigilant. Even an animal eats and looks around constantly prepared. 
I had a hard time becoming a civilian. Why is that? Well, in the service, you tell somebody to do something, it gets done. Civilians don't think that way. Who, who has this got to be telling me what to do? So I had a hard time overcoming that. I did after a few years. I got over it. After I was discharged from the Navy in 1960, I started college and at William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And after my uh, second year of college, Vietnam got hot. And both my parents had been immigrants, and I really felt maybe I owed this country a little bit more. So I went back. The Marine Corps uh, taught me four things. First of all, you have to be very formal in your, in your actions as an officer. You have to be fair with your people, and you have to be firm. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is you got to follow the regulations. So the four Fs for a Marine officer is what he's taught right from school. The military is, um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, probably our best uh, example of, of uh, devotion to country. And that carried over in many ways into uh, my civilian life uh, with uh, leadership in a variety of different roles uh, to um, help uh, uh, the community do better. And you always want to leave the, the world a better place, paying it forward in many ways. Not necessarily that you get any sort of individual recognition for that, but it's that self-satisfaction that you've done something that's important to make people have better lives. As part of a post-Cold War reorganization of the military, Naval Air Station Glenview was deemed as one of several military facilities around the country to be decommissioned in 1993. The base had supported our nation's defense for nearly 60 years. For the men and women who served here, and for the entire community of Glenview, it was the end of an era. We had a uh, decommissioning ceremony uh, for the squadron um, in October of 93, which I attended. And it was a sad, uh, sad day. The last flight was uh, a um, routine um, weekend uh, to uh, take uh, passengers from uh, Naval Air Station Glenview up to the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. They were people who, again, you think about this, it's 23 years that people commuted from places like Des Moines and Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and Fargo, North Dakota. And so it was sad because they were going, right? And sad because this was my last flight. So I had over 3,500 hours of flight time. That's a, that's a lot of flying. Mm -hmm. And uh, miss it, miss it terribly. On February 26, 1995, flight operations at Naval Air Station Glenview ceased when the last three P-3 Orion Patrol aircraft crews made their way down the runway for the last time. One by one, the planes took off into the overcast skies over Glenview, and as they made a final pass over the base, each plane dipped its wings in salute and flew away forever. On September 30th, 1995, Naval Air Station Glenview was officially closed. The Navy turned the miles of runways, land, and buildings over to the village of Glenview. The village accepted the land along with the role as master developer and went to work to create a plan to reuse the land for the interest and benefit of its residents. The result was The Glen, an ambitious urban-style residential and commercial development project that now houses more than 2,000 upscale homes, retail shopping centers, recreation facilities, and public parks. In the Glen Redevelopment Project mission statement, the Village of Glenview committed to accomplishing this by redeveloping Glenview Naval Air Station that recalls its rich history. A small group of veterans and patriotic citizens were among the founding members of Save the Hangar, an organization formed to holding Glenview to its promise of preserving the history of Naval Air Station Glenview. Despite their efforts, 
80% of the original buildings were demolished. Developer Oliver McMillan did agree to preserve the control tower in the original Hangar 1 building by working it into the architectural design of the Glen Town Center. The original Hangar 1 is now listed on the National Register of Historical Places. A small retail space was offered at a reasonable rate to the Hangar 1 Foundation for a modest museum that opened in 2003. Less than a year after they opened their doors, the museum was forced to find a new location. It's now located in a small remote warehouse building on Lehigh Avenue, which serves as a makeshift museum housing the thousands of historical documents and artifacts. Uh, Von Maher decided he wanted to buy an airplane and put it in Von Maher department store. So they looked around for a, for a, a plane that would get in there. So they, they decided on the, the, steer, the Stearman. And they bought the Stearman and they brought it up from uh, Louisiana. It was flyable. It was a crop duster. Really? And they had to take all the oil out of it in order to transport it, as you know. So they restored it. They took it. the wings off, oh, really? put it on a flatbed, took it, and then put it in the building before the building was built, you know, before it was remodeled. Right. In the center of the Glen Town Center stands Navy Park, a memorial that includes three bronze statues, representing a sailor, a pilot, and a deck crewman. The developer says, we want a fountain or something. He said, uh, what would you like to do with it? I says, well, well, why don't we sell bricks? And then I'll buy statues with the money. And the statues are over there. Those are my statues, incidentally. If you ever close down, I want them back. <laughs> Those are the miniatures of the statues that are at the Glen. Those are the and they came from Pensacola. Oh, yeah. So we had them made. But I had to go get the money. I didn't have the money yet. So I went to the city of Glenview, and I had to appear before the, the board, and I said, I'd like to borrow $100,000 to, uh, to build these statues and fix up the, there's a tail hook out there and the pole, the yeah. flagpole, the Beautiful whole works. Part. So the city said, well, tell us what you want to do with the money. So I told them we're going to build the bricks and pay $100 each and put the name in it. I think there's one around here with sure. my name on it. And we'll put those in the ground, and we'll sell a thousand of them at a hundred dollars a piece, and that's the that's the hundred thousand. That's the money for the statue. That's the money for the statues. They said, "Okay, we'll we'll loan you the money." They gave me a checkbook, and the three statues didn't cost us a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it, it cost about fifty, right. and we we paid them back, and they said, "You can pay us back, and if you don't pay us back within five years, we'll forgive you the loan." I've always said that if, if it wasn't for the Second World War, this would be O'Hare. <laughs> and I don't think the people of Glenview would, would really appreciate that. <laughs> I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. And we sit with the old timers. And we say, you know, we really lived in the best of times. It weren't easy, but there were good times. You did things, you made things, it was family, it was, you know. Yeah, it's still fun. Yeah, single engine, little, little puddle jumper, yeah. <laughs> no, I would say that being in Glenview was probably half my life. Yeah. I raised my kids here, I educated my kids, they're all successful. Well, we were just doing our job, and like I said, the, the dedication and the, the fact that we want to preserve the memories and the, the history, because a lot of people don't know what this was a active naval air station with uh, two or three thousand people coming in here on, on uh, at least two of the uh, four weekends of the month. This is a very small museum. We have other things that we could show, but we cannot put it all out here because we don't have the space for it. Well, there's that, you know, there's uh, some people put it into words and poetry, if you will, and it is sort of that um, uh, quiet, uh, you know, reaching the, the bounds of the earth or breaching the bounds of the earth, depending upon your perspective. Uh, and uh, it's peaceful. What I did here at Glenview is kind of a, a reflection of what I thought my life was going to be. 
That's true. Glenview is my home. Glenview will always be my home. And, uh, and all the things in here, some of these things are the things that, I belo that belong to me. They represent your life. Yeah, so yeah. it is my life. Yeah. To those men and women who served at Naval Air Station Glenview, we salute you. May future generations never forget the important contributions to our community and to our nation made in this great place we call home, Glenview.